I realized there was this disconnect from here's a plan, right? Lots of people go on diets and so they want to follow this perfect plan, but they forget that they're living this imperfect life and they have to learn how to create the plan that works for them in the life that they're living. Living a healthy, balanced life is no small feat, especially when you're a mom. With meals to cook, laundry to load, work to do, and humans to raise, it can be easy to feel like we're in an on-again, off-again relationship with healthy living. But it doesn't have to feel this way. I believe living a healthy life has become way too complicated. What we need isn't a new plan or program telling us what to eat or how to live. We need simple, uncomplicated routines and information that's going to help us live our best, most beautiful life without rules and restrictions. Join me, Kristen Dofniak, holistic health coach, certified intuitive eating counselor, and mama of two for weekly conversations on what it means to live a healthy, balanced life uncomplicate eating and simplify in every area of mom life. Hey friends, welcome back to the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. Kristen here, holistic health coach, certified intuitive eating counselor, and your host. Today we are continuing the conversation that we've been having for a while about the topic of our weight and intuitive eating and food freedom. It's a topic that I don't think gets talked about enough, but I think is on a lot of women's minds. And so I'm so excited for the episode I have for you today with my guest, Elizabeth Dahl, who really came on and kind of blew my mind with how well she shared how really creating a positive, accepting relationship with our bodies and releasing body shame helps to get us off of the diet cycle, but that it's also okay if we have the desire for our bodies to change. And she really held the space for both of those feelings in this episode. She shares how to work on accepting your body first and how to treat your body with love even if you don't love your body right now and how important it is to release that shame and accept your body if you do want to make long-term changes to your health, to your wellness, and yes, even to your weight. And so we talked about this idea of whether or not long-term weight loss is actually possible. And we talked about the topic of natural weight loss and what happens when we restrict our bodies for so long, when we're on this on-again, off-again dieting cycle, and why it's so important that we nourish our bodies and we eat enough and we take care of our bodies and how that can help us to potentially lose weight naturally and find our natural size, but that it's also okay if we don't have a goal and our goal is simply accepting our bodies, that our bodies are our choice and our responsibility, no one else's, that no one else can tell you what to do with your body, but it's up to you to take care of your body. So this was such a fabulous conversation. I'm so grateful for her coming on and really sharing her thoughts and her experience with clients and being able to share a little bit more about my thoughts on this topic as well. And I think she was the perfect person to really have this conversation with. So for those of you who don't yet know Elizabeth, Elizabeth Dahl, MS, CEP, is the owner of awomanofwellness.com and helps women who are fed up with dieting make peace with food and find love for their bodies. Elizabeth believes every woman has the knowledge of what she truly needs deep within herself and that they can learn to love their bodies, heal their relationship with food, and find joy in exercise and movement. She helps by offering online programs to women searching for food freedom and a desire to live a happy, healthy lifestyle without limitations. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Welcome to the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. I am so excited to have you on. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. It is going to be such a great conversation. I already know it. This is a topic that 
I know that so, so many women struggle with. So I'm so excited to get into kind of the meat of our conversation, but I love to start with just a really short and easy icebreaker. So I want to know what you drink first thing in the morning when you wake up. Oh man, I'm so boring. Water. (laughs) (laughs) That's not boring. That's a good answer. Water is good for us. (laughs) I'd like to pretend that it was like some fancy lemon water or something, but that's like maybe occasionally. (laughs) Good old fashioned water. Yes. <laughs> Are you a coffee drinker or a tea drinker? No, I don't. I, I, I don't know. I've tried the tea thing. It's not really my thing. Like I it just, I don't know. Plain water is perfectly fine. I like hot chocolate, but obviously it's filled with lots of sugar. So it's like more of a treat than anything else. <laughs> yes. That's so funny. I'm a coffee drinker through and through. So I love hearing people who have a different routine, people who just have water, people who have tea. So I love this question. It's just a fun way to get to know each other. <laughs> yeah. So I would love to start off by just having you share your personal story. So you help women overcome emotional eating and build a better relationship with food and their body. So what made you want to help women in this way? Maybe what experiences in your own life prompted you with this passion for helping other women? Yeah. So I actually started in this whole world as a personal trainer and I loved working as a personal trainer, but I found something that was kind of off for me. So I would give I'd meet with these women and we'd meet maybe two, maybe three times a week, right? And we'd exercise together. And then I'd give them their at-home plans for nutrition and exercise. And the thing that I would find is that they would come back and they wouldn't do the things that I gave them to do. So they'd show up and do the stuff that we did there. They'd come back and be like, life got stressful. Uh, This happened, that happened and all this. And it was frustrating for me because what I had been taught that far was that they, like, if you follow the plan, it works. Right. And so it, for some reason, there was this disconnect there for me of like, well, why aren't they following the plan? I know it works. Why are they struggling so much? And I realized it's because I was trying to fit a perfect plan into a very imperfect lifestyle. And so that's kind of where my journey be toward what I do now began is that I realized there was this disconnect from here's a plan, right? Lots of people go on diets and so they want to follow this perfect plan, but they forget that they're living this imperfect life and they have to learn how to create the plan that works for them in the life that they're living. And so that's what led me down the road of, okay, how do we approach behavior change, especially as moms, especially as women, we we have so many hats that we wear, right? And so when I think about trying to incorporate all of the things that you want to be able to do and all the ways that you want to take care of your body, we have to accept (laughs) that life isn't perfect and we'll never have a perfect plan, but we can learn how to incorporate health and wellness into the lifestyle that we're living. And so that's really what led me to go on to more school and more things so that I could help coach women through it rather than just say, here you go, go figure it out. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. And you can see me nodding along with you, but it is crazy how similar our stories are in many ways. So being a, I was a group fitness instructor and a personal trainer for a while myself as well. And I had my own kind of personal journey with an unhealthy relationship with food. And that's why I talk about a lot of these things as well. Um, but I also had a very similar experience with women. And I had also had women who would like follow the plan and then they would come back to me and like beat themselves up and go like, I followed it, but then I fell off of it. And it seems to be, I love that you're, you know, you made that connection between we're trying to follow a perfect plan, but we live in perfect lives. And this whole diet industry tries to tell us that if we just follow the plan, everything's going to be good. But if it doesn't fit in with our life, well, then we end up beating ourselves up over it, right? So it's a huge, huge problem in our society, I think. So I think... um, I think what you're doing is great and so important. And I, I want to touch on, so on your website, kind of reading into your story a little bit, you talk about having kind of this perfectionistic mindset around kind of food and fitness and all of this for a while. So I wanted to start by just talking a little bit about this idea of perfectionism when it comes to food and our bodies and wanting to follow the perfect plan and feeling like we need to follow a perfect plan in order for 
us to have perfect results, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so can we talk about how having this perfectionistic mindset really kind of disrupts our relationship with food and our relationship with our bodies? Absolutely. And you know, I think we have to kind of go even a little bit step backward to say like, where does the perfectionistic mindset come from? Like, where are we taught that? And the way I see it is we're kind of taught that from diets and the wellness industry, because this is what I want everyone to know is that diets are a broken system for you, not for the diet industry, right? So they actually want you to keep coming back. They've designed their diets for you to fail at them. And sometimes that's like this mind blowing, like, wait, what? (laughs) But, but that makes sense, right? Because it's, they're in it for the money. A lot of them. I mean, there's some good components to, um, wellness industry. Like there's some good things out there, of course. But like when we think about trying to follow this perfect plan, that's where it comes from. It stems from them saying the only way that you're going to ever get results is if you follow this. And so this is what I like to kind of share with my audience is that we are taught throughout our lives to take an outside in approach, which means we take what someone outside of us has told us, the diet industry, our moms, our friends, someone we looked up to, and we listen to what they say to then basically do what we do. It creates a belief. It creates a story that we say to ourselves that we then believe that we follow. So let me give you an example. If you were to say, the only way that I've ever been able to lose weight is on this particular diet when I have to restrict my food. So when I'm ready to lose weight, I the only way I believe that I can do that is by going back on this diet because that's the only thing that's worked for me in the past. And so that's where the perfectionistic mindset comes in is, well, this is the only way it's worked for me. So I have to be perfect at it for a certain amount of time. And perfection is very much a finite amount of time. We look at it in this way of, okay, well, I can be perfect for three weeks, six weeks, you know, and all of that. And so that's what these diets don't teach us is like, what else do we do beyond the six weeks? Right. And I like to compare it to, um, sprinters and long distance runners. Our body has energy systems that are made to go fast and that are made to go fast and short and slow and long. And when we're sprinters, we can go really fast, but we can only use that energy system for a short amount of time. And then we fizzle out. Long distance runners can tap into a different energy system where they can go for a long period of time, but they don't go as fast. And we always jump into diets and wanting to change ourselves because, or not even because, but we look at it as a sprint where we're like, okay, I can push through this for this amount of time. And so we've just been taught that. And so that's where that perfectionism comes in is that it's, it's just kind of been ingrained in our culture that if we see someone doing it that way, they must do it all that way perfectly. And we don't see all the other things. I, I, I struggle seeing like when people are doing the perfect meal plans and I go, oh my goodness, like, is that realistic? <laughs> it's not in my house. <laughs> it's absolutely not in my house. You know, we eat out sometimes. We do think like, this is just normal life. And my goals can still fit in my normal life, but we've been conditioned to believe that unless we're perfect on it, we won't get the results that we want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it sets us up for this unrealistic idea that if we just stick to it for this long, then we make it happen and then it'll just last. I think that's the biggest lie. And I love that you went back and you kind of debunked this this idea that, you know, the diet's just going to, we just have to do it once and then it'll last forever. But the diet industry really, truly does design these plans for the most part in a way that'll make us coming back, make us come back. I think of it kind of as the, um, like the iPhone where, <laughs> I don't know, I have an iPhone. I'm an Apple user. I am not trashing Apple. I love them. They're great. I'm on a Mac right now, but I do feel like there's like an expiration date to the phone and eventually it stops working as well. And they, you want to buy it and you have to buy a new phone. And I feel like that is by design. Otherwise you would always have one phone forever. So breaking free of that mindset around dieting though, 
And this perfectionistic, if I just do this, I'll get the results and it's a short-term thing. That's really hard. It's really ha- hard to have that long-term approach because I think it's scary to think I've got to do something for the rest of my life. Absolutely. And it, and that's the thing I, I, I want to, anyone that's here and listening, like I want to honor that fear, right? There's fear there because if you believe that the only way you lose weight on a diet, then you have a belief that when you're off the diet, you're out of control. And that's where we really struggle of the, the all or nothing. I mean, that's another word for the perfectionistic mindset is you're either all in or you're all out and there's no happy middle. And that's what we're trying to get to. Hey friends, I am interrupting this episode real quick to tell you about a company I am so excited is supporting the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. If any of you know anything about me, you know that I am a huge foodie, I love food, and I also love to drink a delicious glass of wine alongside my food. But a couple years ago, I started learning some insider secrets to the wine industry that I had no idea about. Things that were actually pretty shocking as someone who has been drinking wine on the regular since I was 18. Now, don't worry, I was studying abroad in Italy and then I moved to Canada, so it it was legal, but I've been enjoying wine for almost a decade and I had no idea that there are very little legal requirements for wine. They can add extra alcohol to their wine and a host of other additives, including added sugar, and other things that just don't make us feel very good when we drink a glass or two. And furthermore, wines that have added alcohol and added sugar also don't go as well with food, so the actual experience of drinking wine just isn't as good. And then I was introduced to Dry Farm Wines. Dry Farm Wines sources pure natural wines and lab tests to ensure that each bottle is sugar-free, lower in sulfites, and lower in alcohol, making us feel better when we enjoy our glass of wine. Dry Farm Wines is dedicated to supporting small natural growers currently sourcing from 600 family farmers who preserve 87,000 acres of organic vineyards and save 1.4 billion gallons of water annually by not irrigating their vines. So Dry Farm Wines aren't just good for our bodies, they're good for the world as a whole as well. They vet each grower's practice and support those who focus on regenerative farming, biodiversity, hand harvesting, and the absence of industrial additives. Dry Farm Wines is proud to be the largest natural wine merchant in the world, and I am so excited that they are supporting the Healthy Balanced Mama podcast by offering you a bottle of their delicious Dry Farm Wines for only a penny. That's right. When you sign up for one of their memberships, and let me just talk about their membership for just a second. This is a wine club, which means you can choose the amount of wine you want to get each month. You can get six bottles of wine or 12 bottles of wine, and you can get them monthly every other month. They are so flexible about allowing you to skip a month or a couple months to change the type of wines you want, whether you want white wines or red wines or rosés or sparkling wines or orange wines because yes that's actually a thing and they're delicious and they really let you pick and choose how much wine you want to get and when is most convenient for you and your family to receive your wines when you sign up for your first month and you try it out you can get one full bottle of wine for only a penny. All you have to do is head to dryfarmwines.com slash healthymamachris. I'll put the link in the show notes, but that's dryfarmwines.com slash healthymamachris. Your free bottle will be instantly added to your first purchase. All right, let's get back to the episode. So the way that I like to look at health and wellness and, and getting out of that perfectionistic mindset, getting out of that all or nothing thinking is looking at our health on a pendulum where it's, we swing one way or the other. And usually when we're on diets, we swing toward this extreme side of restriction and rules. And I have to do it this way. I have to be perfect. And then when we go off of the diet or we mess up, we swing all the way to the other side that says like, screw this, I'm done. I'm going to eat whatever I want. I don't even care. Like just this freedom without any sort of regard to health or anything like that. And so when we're thinking about um, trying to give up that perfectionistic mindset, 
we have to try to avoid the extremes and find that happy middle. It's okay to have goals. It's okay to want to achieve things, but we want to be able to find that balance between, okay, it's okay to have some, not restrictions, some guidelines on food and movement and, and some things, the routines and habits that you follow that help you stay in that happy middle from going all the way to the extreme and all the way to the freedom, like this restriction versus the freedom. How do we find that happy middle? Yes. Oh my gosh. I 100% agree with you. And this is actually, this conversation that we're having today is really coming at the perfect time on the podcast as well, because I'm I'm sharing a couple of my thoughts around weight loss and intuitive eating and how it feels very much in the world of intuitive eating. And I know this is a little controversial, but I this is what I feel. I feel like it's almost not allowed to discuss food freedom and then also a desire to maybe change our bodies or even improve our health in some cases. And it almost feels like if we have goals, then we're not allowed in the intuitive eating club or food freedom doesn't allow us to also live a healthy life. It And it's exactly like you said, it almost feels like the pendulum has swung to the entire, the, the entirely other, other side because I'm all about intuitive eating and food freedom and but I'm also about health and wellness, just like you are. I think we're very much on the same page with this. But it really does feel almost prohibitive for somebody to have goals and to also want this freedom from dieting and from this perfectionistic all or nothing mindset around food. So I'm like nodding along with you going, oh yes, this is, this is so good. So I want to talk a little bit about about this idea then. So how can we, because we really want to dig into the topic of, of body shame, but I kind of want to start with reconciling this idea, this idea that we can't have food freedom or eat intuitively and also have goals. How do we really learn to, you know, kind of accept our bodies in the here and now enough so that we can move away from this idea of dieting, but also have goals. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I, I have very strong feelings about this too, (laughs) because that is a very strong message that some people get with intuitive eating that I can't, that I shouldn't, if I don't want to have goals or if I, intuitive eating is not about creating body goals And that's absolutely not what it is. And I like to look, I like to share this analogy because I think it's helpful to go away from food and exercise and get another analogy that helps bring it home. I like to think of it as, let's talk about financial freedom, okay? As if we're talking about food freedom, let's talk about financial freedom. When I think about financial freedom, I think, well, I can go spend whatever I want. I can do whatever I want, all these things, right? And There is a time and a place when if you're in a really difficult time with money and you struggle, I've always struggled with scarcity mindset in my life. I kind of did have to swing to the other side of like freedom, spend the money, get it out in the world, like allow abundance to happen. But then I hit this place of like, well, I'm doing that, but I'm not managing my money. And what I realized, and I had to have some people help me with this actually, was that being able to manage my money is a gift because it allows me to intentionally spend money on the things that bring me joy. And it allows me to manage the money in a way that helps me live a full and abundant life. So when we bring it back to food, this is this exact same analogy. When you start on the intuitive eating pathway, and if you've been in restriction for so long, you may swing really hard and you may have to just experience that food. And I teach that that is okay to experience that food and make food available in your life, especially if it's been off limits for so long. But then there comes a time where you have to look at it and say, okay, in what way can I manage, if that's the best word I can use, food in my life so that it serves me in the best way possible? Because when I swing on either end of the spectrum, it's not serving me in the best way. And so then we have to bring it again back to that happy middle of this is a gift for me to fuel my body with food that gives, me, gives my body what it needs. And it's an opportunity to practice wellness in my life. And so that's where I like to, that's kind of the analogy that I like to give when we think about 
like, like I know we're going to be talking about body image in a little bit, but being able to love your body and still wanting change. And that's exactly the, the answer is that you can have both. It's okay. But the way that we approach it has to be the right way. Yes. Oh my gosh. hundred percent. So let's dig into that a little bit more then. Let's talk about the way we feel about our bodies and how that affects our relationship with food. Because I know for me, for the vast majority of my life, I, and most of the listeners know my story, but in case they don't, and in case you don't, I struggled with an eating disorder in high school for high school and early college for a few years, recovered by medical standards, but I never really healed my relationship with food. So I went back and forth and back and forth on diets for years and years up until the point where I was like super into fitness. That was the personal training phase, did a fitness competition, which was crazy. And then eventually discovered intuitive eating. But throughout that time, for myself personally, and I know this is true for so many of the women that I work with and that are in both of our communities, my decisions around food were based on how I felt about my body. So when, even when I, my, my eating disorder was more of a control thing in my life, more than anything, a little bit was about my body. But once I regained a little bit more weight than I was comfortable with after my eating disorder, I immediately went back on a diet because I hadn't, I didn't have a healthy relationship with food. And my view of myself was that now my body is bad because I gained weight. And I think a lot of women have, and that was, that was like on and off for years, like almost a decade on and off until I really discovered intuitive eating and started learning body acceptance, which has been quite the journey. And I know we're going to talk more about that, but I think many, many women have this same idea where they might want to live a healthy life, but their actions towards food and their relationship with food is really dictated by their bodies and oftentimes feeling shame about their bodies. So this is what I want to dig in. And this is something you speak a lot about is this idea of body shame. So can you speak a little bit to that about the way we view our bodies and how this affects our relationship with food and our decisions around food? Yeah. So one of the things that I, I tell people is that body shame is the entrance to the diet cycle. Mm. And what is the diet cycle? I need to, I'm going to try to explain it without a picture here, but Basically, when we start a diet, 90, probably for 97, at least percent of us, it's because we want to get out of our current body. It's a, it's an approach out of desperation of like, I don't want to be in this body anymore. I want to get out of it. And that's the entrance to the diet cycle where we get in, we restrict, we see results We go, yeah, you know, this is going to work. This is great, whatever. And then life happens and then we binge and then we regain the weight plus more. And if you try to picture that image on a, on a, like a cycle, like a circle, um, the way that we enter the diet cycle is always from body shame. And so when we think about trying to change our bodies, the approach cannot be out of shame and it cannot be out of desperation. What does this mean? (laughs) This does not mean, I have strong opinions about this too, is that this does not mean that you have to love your body today. There are a lot of women that have a lot of trauma with their bodies. Maybe they've been let down by their bodies. They've struggled in their body for most of their life. We, I think we all have a, a few stories about how we feel we present, our body is presented to the world. And so what I say is you don't, you don't have to show up and be like, and love everything about yourself right now. But we need to learn to show up in love for our bodies. So when we think about showing up in our love, showing up in love for our body, can we think about what if I just was willing to accept my body where it is today and knowing that I'm working on changing it? That's okay. We can say something like that. What if I look to have body gratitude today? Because I'm certain that no matter how much our body has let us down, there's something about it to be grateful. Have you birthed children? Have you run a marathon? Have you carried a heavy box? Like there is something that we can be grateful for about our bodies. And so sometimes it's the culture is love your body, love your body, love your body. And women feel very, um, 
feel like that's a very hard goal to achieve right now, especially if they're in a place where that's never been the case for them. And so what I like to look at and say is, what if you took a minute to look at the woman that you wanted to become? Okay, so what what woman do you want to be in, in the body that you want to be in? Like, if you just kind of visualize, like, how would that woman show up in the world? What would she do? What would she, what would she be like? How would she feel? What kind of habits would she have? If you were going to say, I am a woman of wellness, that's why I do what I do. That's why my name, that's why my business is named that. If you could look into it and like, what does a woman of look like, wellness look like in my life? Then you come back and you meet yourself where you are today. And you say, is there a way that I can practice being her now? Mm -hmm. Is there a way that I can see what she does? She loves her body or she is kind to her body or she eats vegetables or she exercises regularly. And I can come back and say, is there something that I could do right now to start acting just like her and start working toward the woman that I want to become? And then it then it bridges the gap between wanting body change and accepting yourself. You can accept yourself where you are right now today because your worth is not defined by your size. Your worth, your weight has absolutely nothing. If you gain and lose weight, we've all done that. Has your worth changed as a result of that? Absolutely not. If I met you, I met you today, right? I didn't meet you when you were in your figure competition years. But sometimes we compare ourselves to who we used to be. Mm. And I love you for who you are today. And I don't know who that woman was back then, but I have a feeling that your value was still exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at it that way, we can marry the two ideas of it's okay to, um, it's okay to want change. And it's also okay to accept who I am right now and know that it's enough right now. And I can still show up in love for this body that I'm in right now, because that's the only way that you're going to get happy and lasting change. And honestly, if you think about the times in your life that you've lost weight, have you ever really loved your body more after the weight loss? It's rare. And lots of women would come to me and say, well, I lost weight, but I don't feel any better in my body is because in order to love who we are, we have to start there. Yes. Oh my gosh. I could just mic drop podcast off right now. It's <laughs> so, so good. Oh my gosh. I know I'm, I'm thinking about my past self and how every time I would meet a so-called goal in my weight or my fitness or whatever it was, I was never satisfied. And I remember the night before my fitness competition, when I am like covered in like spray tan and all like teeny tiny and I haven't barely eaten anything in days and I haven't drank any water that day. And I'm like, you know, nitpicking my body and asking my husband, like, do you think I'm too bloated? Like, do you think, do you think, and I was like, I was at the, I mean, I wouldn't say I was certainly not at the, the epitome of health or even really fitness, but body maybe. Right. And I remember just still being so disappointed that I wasn't at the next level, the next level. And I remember thinking later on a few months down the line, um, after I decided that I wasn't going to compete anymore after my, my, <laughs> I did the one competition and I was like, mm, yeah, this is not the life that I want to live. And I remember going, I don't think I was ever going to be satisfied. It was just going to be an endless cycle of trying to be better and being unsatisfied and trying to be better and being unsatisfied. And that, that was, you know, a very, very extreme example, but I think it's like that for a lot of women or many, many women who have goals of weight loss. And it's so, so important that we accept our bodies now. And then we can move forward, just like you said, into if we want to make changes to our bodies, we're doing it from a place of loving our bodies and caring for our bodies and wanting to be women of wellness. So I want to know then, if you have a client you're working with or somebody, a part of your course who has these desires, so you're working with her or you're teaching her about 
body acceptance and to learn to love herself where she is now, or maybe not love herself, right? Because we don't have to love ourselves, but learn to treat her body with love where she is now while also desiring change. What are some of those steps that you recommend she take? I know that you said, you know, picturing yourself where you want to be and how can you take steps towards that? But while you're on that journey, how do you stay in that? How do you stay the course of not going into, not going back into that space of going, oh, my body isn't good enough. My, it's not changing fast enough. Or, you know, that cycle that many people get in where you're like, you have that, that motivation in the, in the very beginning to make changes, whether it is with intuitive eating or you're on a diet or any sort of change that you're making in your life. I think there's that initial excitement and motivation. And then when it's sort of, it dies down a little bit, or we don't see the results we want so fast, then we tend to go backwards a little bit. And we tend to go back to, oh, we start to feel that shame again. So what are maybe some steps or some advice you have for the woman who might be moving forward a little bit in this, but still sort of still feeling a little bit stuck in this place of it's not happening fast enough or, okay, I know I'm supposed to accept my body now, but I want to change and it's not, it's not happening the way I want it to. Yeah, absolutely. And and so the thing that I think about is when we want to change our body physically, what do we do? We change our nutrition, we change our exercise, our movement, right? And it's just like that. We have to create a habit and routines around changing those areas of our life. And so when we think about wanting to, you know, show up in love for our bodies and, and reach the goal of, of loving our bodies. Um, I like to think of it as a practice. And a lot of times we don't think this, this should be a practice, right? It's not part of diets. It's not part of anything like that, but it's a prerequisite to being able to lose the weight, make the body change goals a reality for you. And we do it with a practice and I call it a body freedom practice. And so what you want to do is take a minute to think, where on the spectrum am I with my body? Do I love my, but like, do I love my body? Can I accept it? Can I respect it with gratitude? Can I just look at it as neutral? Like it, it's just, it is what it is and it serves a function rather than, you know, judging it based on any looks or anything like that. Um, and so you create this, where am I and where, and where do I want to go? Like, do I want to have more gratitude for my body? Do I want to have more acceptance for my body? And then once you figure that out, then you take a minute to think what body freedom practice could I do? What habit could I create so that I can work toward that goal? So if I have a goal of feeling more grateful for my body so that I can show up and love for it, give it the food it wants and needs, give it the movement it wants and needs, then I need to find a way to practice gratitude for my body daily. And that could be, you know, affirmations that could be writing it down before bed. It could just be thinking your body in the mirror, whatever it is for you, you've got to create that habit, that routine. And when you do it regularly, it works. And so many times we forget we, we give up before it starts working. Right. Because it's just like frustrating and I get it. It's frustrating. Like, it's your body's not going to change on its own just by showing it like just by showing it gratitude. That's not going to bring weight. That's just waking up every day and saying, I'm thankful. But if you could say, I'm thankful for this body and it carried over to, I'm not going to eat that fifth cookie tonight, or I'm going to say no to that ice cream because I know it doesn't feel good for my body. And I'm trying to give it the things that feels good. Then that's where the change is created. And so alone, the body freedom practice is not going to give you the weight loss, but it's an absolute essential to start helping you create those habits and routines that will lead you to the body change. And there's this quote that I love. It says, when I accept myself as I am, then I can change. So the only way that we're ever going to see happy and lasting change is if we are learning to accept our bodies where they are as we're starting right now. And that's it. And and I know it's a hard thing to believe, but when we think about our past and our history with diets, 
desperation and shame have never worked. So what if we try this different way? What would change, you know? And it's, and it's kind of exciting. It's kind of this new way of like, I don't have to do the diet again. I don't have to go down that path. I'm in. <laughs> I hope everyone's feeling that way. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. There's so much freedom in what you're sharing. And it really sounds like a it's body acceptance. And then it's also bringing in that body honoring. So you are honoring your body by making the decisions that are positive for her. And I think going back to this little bit controversial message (laughs) that we can't necessarily or we shouldn't focus on things like nutrition or have the desire to change our bodies. And I mean, gentle nutrition is one of the principles of intuitive eating. And something that I try to bring in when I'm working with women is, you know, it's teaching them to look at nutrition as a way to honor our bodies instead of, you know, controlling our bodies. And it sounds like, you know, this is very similar where we are tuning into our bodies and we are asking our bodies what they need within freedom, right? We're giving them, we're giving them the freedom to eat the cookies, but it's going, okay, so how many cookies is really honoring my body? <laughs> it, is there a point where I'm going beyond freedom and I'm going to the point where I'm not really taking care of my body? So accepting our bodies and not having that be a negative decision to not have the fifth co- cookie, but having it be this really body honoring decision. I have a follow-up question then when it comes to changing our bodies, because we hear a lot and we know, we know the research says that diets do not work, that 95% of the time diets don't work, that weight is regained within three to five years. And somehow everyone seems to think that they're the 5%, (laughs) that they're just going to follow the diet. And that's going back to the perfectionism, right? If I just follow the plan, then I'm going to get the results I want. But there are women, like we're talking about, who still want body change and who still want to change their bodies and still want to lose weight. And kind of what you're, what you're sharing is this really body honoring, body accepting, body loving way that we can potentially change our bodies. But there's a lot of messages out there that tell us that it's just impossible. And so that we could maybe, we should maybe just give up. I think it's kind of the message that's out there sometimes. It's like, well, I either go on a diet and I change my body, but it's not going to last. Or I just do nothing and I just keep gaining weight forever and ever. Or my body just always stays the same. And then that shame piece comes in, right? Where they're not happy with their bodies, but they maybe they don't feel good in their bodies. That's something that I hear from women and I try to encourage them in this. And that's why I started talking about this on the podcast too, even though it felt uncomfortable and it felt like I was going to get some backlash (laughs) when I started talking about the topic of weight loss, because I've had women come to me and say, I don't feel good in my body. It has nothing to do with even you know, wanting to be a different size or the actual weight on the scale so much as my body feels heavy. I don't feel good anymore. And I've been working on this intuitive eating thing and I still want my body to change. So my question is, do you believe that long-term change is possible? Is long-term change possible from this place of accepting our bodies in the here and now, but also wanting to, to work towards change? Do you believe that it's possible? I mean, obviously you're sharing all of this, but just to encourage the woman listening that there is a there is a middle ground, right? What does that middle ground look like where maybe lasting change is possible? And how is it possible to create lasting change? I know that's a big question. (laughs) Well, I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe it for sure. (laughs) But um, here's the thing. This is something that I feel very strongly about is that no one besides you, beside you, is allowed to make the decision about your weight and your weight loss. There's lots of doctors out there that say you should lose weight. And I've had clients come to me. They're like, every time I go to the doctor, they're like, they tell me to lose weight. And I understand this because I've been in the uh, world of corporate wellness where we did a lot of biometric screening. We took people's cholesterol, their weights, their um, blood lipids. I'm trying to think of the word that's not science, but (laughs) their glucose levels, like all of these, the sugar levels, And um, we would classify them essentially as healthy or not healthy, right? Mm -hmm. Based on those things. And, oh, I see my, I see the error in my ways now. But um, when I think about that, the thing that I want every, every single woman to know is that nobody gets to make the decision about weight loss besides you. Okay. So that is a choice that is only about you. 
But then the thing that I want you to ask yourself, and, and this could be a little bit like, this is one of those like hard questions, but it's time to ask it. It's time to bring it up is, is your weight due to unhealthy behaviors? So there's a difference between women come in all different shapes and sizes and women can be healthy at all different shapes and sizes. I don't care what the BMI says. I don't care what your cholesterol says. I've seen women who are healthy with high cholesterol, okay? So the doctors are going to tell you you're unhealthy because of these indicators, but you get to make that choice of what health looks like to you. And I'm guessing that a lot of the women that are feeling this way, that are feeling yucky in their bodies, it's because they're making some choices that aren't aligning with what they want to become. Mm. And so when we think about that, like it kind of puts it back on us. It makes us responsible for our own bodies. And we've been taught for so long that the health, the diet industry is responsible for my body. And it's not. You're responsible for your own body. And so if you feel like you want to lose weight, that's okay. It's an okay goal to have, but you have to con- come to that conclusion on your own. You have to make that decision on your own. And then you have to take a minute to look at your behaviors. What are those behaviors? Are you, you know, at moving your body regularly? Are you eating the foods that will fuel you? Are you staying hydrated? Like you can ask all of these questions without going back into the diet, without going into perfection and just say like, where is the balance in my life? And where do I need to find more balance? And then I know this sounds like, I don't know if cliche is the word, but like, it just sounds maybe a little bit woo woo, but natural weight loss is a reality. When you start to change your habits, you start to consistently give your body what it needs, you can experience natural weight loss. It doesn't have to be hard, but so many times we as women, I want to bring a little science in here because I think that's helpful. Um, We as women, we, we are on this roller coaster. We restrict, then we binge, then we restrict, then we binge, then sometimes we exercise really hard and sometimes we don't exercise. And we've been taught throughout our lives, we've taught our bodies that we restrict. We're not going to give it what it needs. And so our body has learned, okay, I'm not going to get the consistent food and movement that I need. So when I get food, I'm going to hold on to it. Because our body is, we've just taught our body that like, we're not going to be consistent with it. So that messes with our hormones, that messes with our metabolism, all of that stuff. So then we bring intuitive eating in and we bring freedom back in. And so we eat food and this is a necessary prerequisite to finding food freedom. Okay. And and if you're feeling this way, this is normal, but we bring all this food back in and what do we do? We gain weight, obviously, because our body has been taught for so long that we're not going to give it food. So when we give it food, it holds on to it. So the more food we give it, the more it's going to hold on to it until it starts to learn that we're going to consistently give it regular care and food. And then our body learns, oh, you're going to take care of me. So now I can start working the way that I'm supposed to. And so I tell people one of the best ways that we can exist in our bodies is in something called a high energy flux, where we're eating a lot of calories and we're exercising a lot. That's the that turns our body into a fuel burning machine. (laughs) And that's where the weight loss comes. But we're so stuck in the mindset of restriction, 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 that our body just doesn't know what to do. And so when you feel like you're in this place of, you know, I, I want to change my body, I feel yucky in my body. Well, it's because you probably haven't given your body the things that it needs. And so we have to look at how do I how do I give it what it needs consistently? Yes. Oh my gosh. I love it so much. And I, I'm so glad you brought all of that into it. The science, the fact that we do come in all shapes and sizes. And even if I love bringing up the fact that even if we ate the same, even if you and I ate exactly the same and exercised exactly the same, we would still look different because we are in different bodies. I'm only five feet tall. I am never going to look like a five foot, 10 inch 
model. <laughs> it's just not going to happen because I'm only five feet tall. We're all meant to be in different sizes, but we can find that size that's right for us when we are actually giving our bodies what it needs, not when we're restricting ourselves. So I'm so, so glad you brought that into it and you brought the science into it too. You can see me nodding along going, yep, I know. And I experienced that myself. And in speaking a little bit about weight loss and food freedom and all that. I've shared a little bit of my own story too, where I, I was very much that person where I gained a bunch of weight after my fitness competition, some that it was like necessary in the very beginning. And then some that was tacked on afterwards because my body was so restricted for so long. And I think, I think, I don't think very many women realize that their bodies are in this place of starvation on diets. They think, well, I don't have an eating disorder or I'm not starving myself. I'm still eating. I'm, I'm eating what? 1200 calories a day. That's what I'm supposed to eat on this diet, right? <laughs> Cause that's what the diet industry tells us, you know, count and restrict and eat less. And then you're going to reach your goals. But then, you know, women end up with that, that plateau or they end up binging. And then this whole cycle that you're talking about, but knowing that natural weight loss is actually possible when it's right for our bodies that we're all going to end up at a different size and shape, but we can, we can lose weight to a place that's right for us as long as we are, we're actually taking care of our bodies and we're actually giving our bodies what they need. So I appreciate that so much. I know it was kind of a, a complicated way to get to that question, but it was a fabulous answer. So thank you so much for answering that so well um, and giving so many women hope. I think this message needs to be shared more for sure that we can release the shame about our bodies and we can accept our bodies and we can take care of our bodies while still desiring change and that that change is possible. And then when it, that change does happen, it's a natural change and natural changes are the ones that are the sustainable ones, right? I always say that, you know, your natural weight is the one that you maintain without effort. It's not about I'm maintaining my weight or I remember being in the dieting world, especially the fitness world and being in either um, leaning out phase or bulking up phase or maintaining phase and maintenance was an effort. It was something that we, I had to follow. And when I realized that it, I didn't have to follow a plan or a diet or anything to maintain my weight anymore, I was like, Oh my gosh, that's freedom. <laughs> so my body just stays and we're meant to flux, you know, a little bit here and there. That's totally normal. And I flux too, depending on the seasons, totally normal, but I'm not fluctuating three pant sizes in a year anymore. My pants still fit. They just feel a bit different throughout the year. And that's okay. But I'm still fitting into the pants and I'm not focusing on calories or macros or counting or tracking or obsessing in any way. And it's so, it's so possible. So I'm really, really glad that you shared all that. It was so, so great. So I want to know what else you want to share with the woman listening? You have shared so much incredible wisdom with us over the last, you know, 40 minutes or so. What else do you want to share with the woman listening? What is the message that you haven't yet shared that you really want the woman listening who has maybe struggled with body shame and body acceptance and maybe wanting to lose weight, but being on this diet cycle? What, what do you want her to hear right now? I guess the thing that the message that I would leave is your, I mean, I've kind of said it a little bit, but I mean, your worth is absolutely unrelated to your weight. And so I know we've talked about weight loss and we've talked about body change. That's not required. <laughs> Sometimes we think like weight loss, I need to lose weight. And I, I guess I want every woman here to know that if you can reach full acceptance and love for the body that you're in right now, awesome. Mm -hmm. That's okay. There's no wrong answer to this. There's no wrong wrong way to love your body. There's no wrong way to, um, essentially like become who you want to become, um, in the sense of it's okay. It's okay to want change and it's okay to accept and love yourself for you, for who you are right now. And that's okay. And both situations are okay. And it's okay to respect the women that are okay in their bodies right now. And it's okay to respect the women that are trying to figure out what to do with their bodies. And I guess the thing that I would say maybe this would be like a big action step that you could take because we are in the world of social media and just bombarded. If there is anyone in your social media feed that makes you feel any amount less than 
in your body, unfollow them. And sometimes some of them have good intentions. I'm not even saying it's always negative. But if you feel yourself comparing, if you feel less than her, if you find that you go back to body shame or you get triggered, unfollow them. You can go back in the future if it's something that you want to. It's okay. Like this is, I'm not sitting here being like, you can't be friends with your best friend who's in like good, amazing shape and you don't know what to do because you're so jealous, right? Like that's not what I'm here to say is you get to decide who you surround yourself with and how you talk about your body. So make the decision right now that you're going to surround yourself with positive accounts, positive people that help you show up in love for your body today, no matter where it is, because the person that will do that will not judge you for the size of your body in any way. They will be there to support your own own choices and your own decisions. And that at the end of the day is the most important thing. You get to make the decision about your own body. Oh my gosh. What what a beautiful way to to kind of start to close things out. I am so, so glad that you shared that too, because I think that's a, such an important point to bring things full circle that you're allowed to have either goal. You can have either goal and it's about what's right for you. And you're the only one who's allowed to make decisions for your body. I love that so much. This has been so, so good. So I have a few fun little rapid fire questions at the end because I love just bringing joy back into food and into eating again. But before we get to those, I would love for you to just share where the listeners can find you, where they can connect with you, following up on the social media. You have a, an awesome, positive social media account. So can you share all the places my listeners can find you? Yes. So I am on Instagram at a woman of wellness. And my website is also that a woman of wellness.com. And I do have a free mini course that helps women overcome emotional eating. Um, which is really helpful to, as we're thinking about supporting our bodies consistently when we're emotional eating, we're all over the place. And so teaching, um, it, it's basically like a, a little mini training that's teaching you how to deal with your emotions without turning to food. So that's also on my website as well. If that's something that, you know, anyone here really struggles with. Mm, yes. I will put all the links in the show notes and I know I've had Many, many women come to me with experiences with emotional eating and finding that just tackling that emotional eating and getting to the bottom of that has changed their entire relationship with food and their body. And so I'm sure that's going to be such a fantastic resource for women. So thank you for, thank you for sharing that. So my three final, I always call them rapid fire, but I really need to leave rapid fire out of it because you can, you can answer them as long as you want to. I know it's nap time, so you don't have forever. <laughs> but my first question, because like I said, I like to bring joy back to food. What is your favorite thing to cook? Baked goods, hands down. Mm. I love cooking cookies, baking cookies. <laughs> <laughs> See, I am not the baker in my family. My husband is the baker in our family, and my seven-year-old likes to point it out. So I am a chef, so I love to cook, but baking freaks me out because I'm very creative and I don't like to follow rules, uh, at least not when it comes to the kitchen. And so she always likes to point out to people, mommy's not a baker. <laughs> Awesome. So I love finding people who are, who are bakers and I'm like, tell me your tricks. Cause my daughter thinks that I can't bake. <laughs> I'm all about the measuring. See, I'm the, my husband's the same way. He like, he cooks really, he cooks really well. And so he like throws a dab of this and a dab of that. And I'm like, well, how much did you put in? How do I know? And he's like, well, I just tasted it to see. And I said, well, I'll just stick with my measuring. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it's funny because I am very, the, the number one reason I always, I like to talk about the perfectionistic question, like bringing it all the way back to the beginning is because that's just my, that's my nature. I'm an Enneagram one. I am just the kind of perfectionist by nature and I like things to be a certain way. I'm kind of driven by schedules. And for some reason with cooking, that's like the one area I just like release all the rules. It's like, this is just fun. This is just creative. And so I think that's why baking is, is harder for me. So my next question is then what is your favorite thing to order or have someone cook for you? So maybe there's something your husband cooks for you that you really love. Hmm. What do I love? 
my husband makes this really yummy lemon chicken. That's like one of my favorite things that he makes. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm like not picky at all. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty easy going with food. So if somebody makes it for me and I don't have to make it with a toddler pulling on my pants the whole time, I'll eat it. I love it. <laughs> it tastes way better when it's cooked by someone else, right? Oh my gosh. Yes. A hundred percent. I love to cook and I still love when other people cook for me. And I have people like apologize when they give me food because they're like, oh, I know that you like to cook or you know how to cook. And I'm like, are you kidding? This is the best ever because I didn't have to cook. So I'm totally with you on that. I love it. <laughs> So we love to share on this podcast, finding balance in every area of our lives with food, with fitness, and just simplifying our lives as a whole. So I want to know what your beautiful balance means to you. Hmm. I'm going to go against the grain here and say, accepting that there is no actual balance (laughs) because (laughs) I feel like I've tried to find this perfect balance. And what I'm realizing is that finding balance is the pursuit. It's the the opportunity to find the balance is what they're, it's where the joy is, right? Of like finding, okay, this is off. How do I create a better balance in this area of my life? By, but also recognizing I can't, I, I like to think of all those plates spinning. I can't hold all of them at once and let them spin perfectly. Some have to slow down, some must speed up. And, and knowing that like, once I finally accepted that balance wasn't really like an end goal. It was a journey. It made it, it made it, it took a weight off of my shoulders. <laughs> yes. 100%. I, I talk about how balance isn't something that's static and that we really just need to redefine this idea that balance equals perfection. So I am 100% with you on that. I love that. It's really just about joy in that journey of, of finding balance and everything. Oh my goodness. This has been so, so great, Elizabeth. I appreciated this conversation so much and I appreciate you taking your time, your precious nap time with us and sharing all of this. So I just thank you so much for spending this time with me today. Thank you. And I want everyone to know it's, I wish it was my nap time, but it's definitely my kid. (laughs) Wouldn't it be cool if I took my, my own precious nap time away? Maybe I should take my own advice and just nap when my kids nap. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, that's that's what they tell you when you have a newborn, right? Why can't you do it when you have an older kid too? I know. Thank you for clarifying that. It did sound like <laughs> I was saying that you were you were taking a nap, but thank you for taking your precious kids' nap time. <laughs> this was- thank you for having me here. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. If you loved it, would you take a screenshot and share it with a friend over on Instagram and tag me in it? It helps me so much to know what you love and are taking away from each episode. If you really loved it, would you hop over to iTunes and give me a star rating and review? Every rating and review helps this podcast be seen and heard by more women who need to hear the message of balance and wellness without deprivation. It's the best free gift you could give me. And as a reminder, the information and opinions on this podcast are meant for education and inspiration only and are not to be taken as medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please consult with a trusted practitioner before making any changes. Have a beautiful day, friend, and I'll see you in the next episode.